We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. So I'd like you to raise your hand if someone in your life, a young person in your life, often looks like this. So maybe it's a child, a grandchild, the person in the line for coffee in front of you. Okay, you are not alone. Um, meet this generation of digital natives, right? So we've heard that term, a generation of young people that were born um, you know, without knowing a time before the internet. So I'm a digital immigrant. I won't ask you to identify if you are or not. Um, but I, I remember a, a world without the internet and having to learn how to integrate the digital world into how I work, how I communicate. And that's a very different space than our kids are, are growing up in now. So in the digital age, the one thing we do know is that the young people among us are early adopters they are enthusiastic adopters of new technologies. Um, here's some data just from 2004. We started following kids around on their mobile devices around 2007. And this just shows you some of the changes we saw during that time. 2018 is the last time for which we have a representative sample. And 95% of adolescents now have access to a mobile device. Um, they're on them quite a lot. And so a recent survey showed us that tweens, those are our 8 to 12 year olds, they're on 4, you know, 4.36 hours, and this is just for media screen time, so this doesn't count screen time for homework or other activities, right? Um, teens, it's 6.4 hours a day, so almost six and a half hours a day, and I want you to hold the number in your mind, that's the three hours more per day that children from low-income households are on a screen. So there's a huge difference in screen time based on the income level of your, of your family. So we have a sample of about 2,000 young adolescents we've been following, and these are some data on them. This is just them across age. So on the bottom of the screen, you'll see age here from 11 to 15, and you'll see if the young people in your life are around 11 years old, about 48% of their peers own a mobile device. Right? As we get older in our sample, we get up here to almost full saturation. This line up here is access to the internet at home. So something we used to worry a lot about in education was the digital divide. So some kids not having access to the internet, that's no longer true. Um, and smartphone use is actually higher among children from lower income families. So we don't see that traditional digital divide. Um, we see few differences in mobile device ownership by socioeconomic status. But as I'm going to show you, we see differences in experiences and maybe effects. Right? So what does this all mean? You probably, if you pick up a paper, probably today or tomorrow, you'll read some story about how digital devices are ruining our children. Right? Smartphones are destroying a generation. Recently, we had a number of psychologists sign a letter, an open letter to Apple, demanding that tech companies end their addictive practices toward our children. Based on evidence, they said that smartphones were making our children lonely, depressed, suicidal, right? Stealing things from them. These are big claims, right? These are big 
claim. So is this constant connection, is it harmful to our kids? And I'm gonna show you two pieces of evidence. The first one is from a team in Britain and they've assembled large masses of data on hundreds of thousands of adolescents. Now these are surveys, so just correlational research, asking kids to report on the amount of time they're on their devices and their mental health problems. I'm gonna show you a graph here, but the thing to focus on is just this pattern. It's a Goldilocks effect, right? So here are the kids that are not on screen time at all in a day. Here are the kids in those one or two hours, and then here's kind of a deterioration of well-being across time, right? So described as a Goldilocks effect, the kids that are on not at all don't look so great on mental health. The kids in the one to two hour range you know, look good, and then out at the lower ends of the tail, or the higher ends of the tail, those kids are experiencing some problems. Now remember, this is correlational. The other thing to remember is that these data and all the data that are presented, including the data where people argue that smartphones are causing mental health problems, these actually explain less than 1% of the differences between kids and their, men and their mental health. So said another way, 99.5% of the reasons that kids are different than each other on their mental health problems is due to something other than screen time, right? These same authors took other variables they measured in the data chips, or chips, in the data, including potato chips, eating potato chips, higher correlation than screen time, right? Eating breakfast, 14 times higher than screen time, right? So just a, just a word of caution. Now, we took a different approach. We've been following kids on their phone, so we, we have the advantage of not necessarily comparing kids to each other. So a kid who's on zero hours a day and a kid who's on five hours a day, they look very different on things other than screen time, right? Their parents probably have them in a very different structured environment. Lots of things are different. So we looked and followed the same kids over time and asked the question, on days when Sally is using the screens a lot, what does her cognition look like? What does her mental health look like? What does her sleep look like in days when she's using less? So we use her as her own control. This is a study done by uh, Mikey Jensen, one of my postdocs, and this is in North Carolina. This is the state of North Carolina. Um, each one of those red dots is where a family in our study lives, of the 2,000 kids, and 400 of those kids we followed intensively on their phones. So every day, they're reporting to us on how much they're using their devices, um, their mental health, et cetera, and we find very few associations between how much they're using their mental health, right? And where we do find signal is actually in the opposite direction. So days that they're more closely connected to their friends and family online are days that they're less lonely and depressed. But again, really small effects. We've been interested in this. We've been using um, digital technology and mobile phones as a tool to study adolescents' mental health. And when we first started in this area, parents were asking for us advi advice, right? It's scary, right? It's scary to have an adolescent period, right? It's scary to have them glued to their phone all the time. Um, and so what we wanted to dig a little de deeper in was what are the fears, right, that parents have? And what's the science? What do we really know, right? And then what's the narrative? So we went through and we identified these seven fears that parents and adults have when they see young people walking around on their devices. And then we went to the scientific literature and we, we started to examine what, a, what do we actually know about the effects. And here, um, I won't have time to go into them all today, but I'll just summarize with a couple of messages. Um, in most cases, we found mixed results. We need more data. But in the majority of cases, we actually found evidence for positive effects, right? So kids that were most connected online were also most connected offline. If there were signs of vulnerability, bullying, et cetera, offline, those kids were also experiencing problems on, online. So it was a bit of a mirror between online and offline life. Parent time, so it was displacing time you'd spend with parents, but it wasn't impacting the relationship. Right. Where we do find some negative effects is in multitasking, right? So Paula mentioned that before, we need to keep our eye on that, and sleep is critically important, right? So there is no question that um, being on your phone late at night, which many kids are, is impairing sleep in important ways, right? But when we published these results, people were angry, right? Parents were angry at us. Um, we, we were saying that, you know, there are these things that are happening with our kids, other uh, things that we worry about, but we don't think the phone 
is the problem, right? Um, and this wasn't a popular message. And in the discussion section, you guys can yell at me then. I'm used to it now. I wasn't ready for it here, but I'm, I'm ready now. Um, and so what we asked is, what are the risks? What are the risks of assuming that phones are to blame for these really important problems facing our kids um, versus taking a more holistic view? Now, Paula did a wonderful job of asking this question of rewiring the brain, and um, Leah showed us signs of developmental plasticity in the brain, and this has been the focus of extreme attention right now, right? So headlines, are smartphones rewiring the brain? And again, this isn't a new concern, right? Whether tools are impacting the brain in some way. This is from the New York Times in the 1904, right? Concern that these race car drivers might have a different brain, right? We've seen concern. We see fears about new technologies. We saw this with right, a writing, with people starting to write. This is going to impair our ability to remember things. With, with kids, with kids, we've seen this with numerous things. We've seen it with the introduction of romance novels, the introduction of public libraries, rock and roll, things that kids are doing we don't like. My husband started to complain about this, and I said, stop complaining, because I think this means that we're not kids anymore. Uh, <laughs> kids these days. So this is Scientific America. Are smartphones really destroying the adolescent brain? And I think that you know, this is an important question of how the brain is becoming rewired, how we're learning language differently, et cetera. There's a recent article that showed, in fact, digital technology use and thumb movement can be traced differences in this on a day-to-day -day level to cortical activity based on an EEG. And those are important questions. But I think maybe they're the wrong ones right now if we're thinking about our kids' well-being. I think the the questions that we need to be asking are how are these tools used? How are we scaffolding and how are we engaging with these new technologies with our kids and optimizing them for their potential in their future? So um, we wrote recently that smartphones, they might be bad for some teens, right? Um, but not for all. And if you take you back to that initial data that I showed you, children in low-income households spending on average three more hours a day on their phone than kids in more affluent households. It's not just the time difference, it's what you're doing, what you're doing online, right? So higher income households more likely to be using digital technologies for educational purposes, looking up information, right? Lower income households, less parental involvement, less adult involvement on average in scaffolding those behaviors and building digital literacy and the other things that we know our kids are gonna need if the future is in fact digital. In our study, we found that um, children in disadvantaged households, they actually experienced more spillover from social media. So something that happens on social media, actually they report results in an offline problem, a fight, an argument, trouble at school, right? So it might not just be different experiences, it might be different effects for kids that are the most vulnerable. So as we, we look into the future, it's really not so much about the effect of the tool, right? The access, to these tools is equaling out, right? Kids have access to computers, kids have access to smartphones across socioeconomic status, but the types of experiences they're having online, the type of help that they're getting to ensure that they build the skills in an online world and for an online future are very different, and it's possible that there might be more negative effects for certain populations of children. So I would encourage us as we kind of look towards supporting children in the digital world, that we look past some of the headlines, some of the fears that we have, some of the reasons that we don't like the technology itself. And for parents who report the biggest sources of conflict in their home is fights over how long their kid is on a device. And I screamed at my child yesterday for this and caught myself. So instead of focusing on the time limits, focus on what they're doing. Take some time, spend some time with them there. And we're entering into a whole new world as our, our homes get smarter, right? So here's a little boy talking to his Alexia, right? And I'm, I'm sure we'll have a lively discussion of, of what it means to have Alexia raising our children soon. So thank you for your attention um, and for the opportunity.